I'm going to uh, talk about taking your travel photography to the next step today. Um, uh, you know, for the, for the uh, largest part of my career, I've been shooting for publications, National Geographic Traveler, National Geographic Islands, Smithsonian, those kind of magazines. But that world is, is kind of shrinking. And um, um, because of the advances in technology and also the advances in the way that we consume media, um, there, there are new things on the horizon. And um, uh, being a, an old dog, um, uh, learning new tricks is something that uh, uh, I was not uh, really uh, too excited about doing. But, um, but, you know, I've been dragged into this and now I love it. So I'm going to be talking to you today about taking your, your travel photography to the next step in terms of adding audio and maybe even moving images. You know, we have uh, the great confluence of technology now. Our SLRs can shoot movies, uh, you know, and uh, most of us kind of don't know what to do with that. And hopefully today, after today's presentation, you might have a little better idea about what to do with it, including ignoring it, if that's, if you so feel. Uh, but um, I have to tell you that it's a very exciting way to share our visions, because whether you're on a, a trip with Lindblad or you're on your vacation or whatever, when you come back, with your pictures, you're telling a visual story. It could be for your family, could be for your Facebook friends, it could be, you know, for a publication or a, a website or whatever. But we're visual storytellers. I, you know, I started as a newspaper photographer right across the river in beautiful Union City, New Jersey, the garden spot of the Garden State, um, way back in the 70s. And I never, ever really thought of myself, um, I never shot pictures as individual pictures. It was always the story, covering the story, whether it was a news story, uh, a, a, a sports game, or, or some kind of a feature. And, and that has been kind of the guiding um, light of my career. I don't, you know, I've been asked uh, so many times to have uh, uh, gallery shows, and I have them, but I really have a hard time you know, picking my pictures because I don't shoot art pictures, I shoot stories. And, and so this new technology that allows me to show more of the stories and, uh, and show more of the work and, and tell more of a visual story is very exciting. So let's, let's get started. What's the, what's the word for this new uh, stuff? It's multimedia, you know, it's, uh, uh, or multiple platform, I think, is, is the latest thing. Um, it's multidimensional storytelling. It's not just visuals anymore. You are now the author, the producer, the photographer, the editor, the sound man. If you run your own blog or website, you're the ad salesman. You've got, you know, computer problems. You're your own IT manager. It's, it's, we're, we're, we're more and more being asked with this new technology to do more and more things. Um, and um, there's good and bad to that. Um, for me, uh, the bad is, you know, uh, learning new software and that kind of thing. I'm, I'm much more of a field agent than I am um, an IT guy, so I struggle with uh, software. But the good part for me is that now I am the director. You know how they interview actors and the actors always say, I always wanted to direct. Well, way back when, we used to have these uh, gatherings of photographers, you know, uh, a bunch of us, uh, Mike Yamashita and Bob Sasha and guys like that. We used to sit around and we used to have photographers' lottery fantasies, you know. And when you're already traveling all around the world and everything, um, uh, you know, travel for a photographer was easy. But what, what we all decided that our fantasy would be would be to go back and publish a book with all our photo essays. With, with the right pictures picked and the right layouts done. And now we can do that thanks to Blurb or our own websites or whatever. So, so that the good part is now we are the author. We can decide how these stories are used as opposed to giving a, a set of pictures to a picture editor and then not seeing them until they come out in the magazine and you know seeing none of your favorite things done. You're probably the publisher too. That's the, other, the, the new economy um, uh, uh, aspect of it. So, but get ready because compared to digital still photography this is going to be like going from playing checkers to playing three-dimensional chess um, sharing your travels and becoming a multimedia storyteller putting it all together how do we do it how do you take the first steps um, the printed publication market is shrinking uh, that's a, a, a given um, they you know when I first started working for National Geographic in 1979 their circulation was close to 14 million I just saw some figures that came out, 5.5 million. 
that's a big drop, and that's that's the geographic. Every every other magazine, except for I think the fashion magazines and the Ladies Home Journal and whatnot, are um, are um, shrinking just as quickly. But digital allows you to be your own publisher. So in a way, there's more outlets for you to show your work today as a advanced amateurs than ever before. Uh, websites, this kind of thing. So uh, there's actually more out outlets, websites, web galleries, and and what what a screen demands is movement and sound. Um, you, you've all seen probably that YouTube um, uh, thing of the baby picking up the magazine and swiping it like it's an iPad. This is the generation that's coming up that's, that's going to be reading and everything. This is, you know, interactivity, um, movement, sound is the, is the, new, um, the new lingua franca for, for communication. But we still have to shoot for story, and what I'm going to do is going to kind of take you through a story on the Amazon, one of the many places that Lindblad goes. And, um, you know, going with Lindblad on some of these things is the way to go because they have on onboard photographers, usually one nature uh, naturalist trained by a National Geographic photographer and a National Geographic photographer on almost every departure, if not every departure, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, so. Um, so when you go with these guys, you have you know an expert right right with you. But this is the Amazon, so we're going to talk about uh, uh, you know shooting a little story along the Amazon. One thing that we have to learn when you're shooting uh, beyond the the single shot is to pace your story by thinking like a cinematographer and mixing up your shots to create a, a visual narrative. Now, what do I mean? I mean we had to do this as magazine photographers too, and this is one one thing that I see in a lot of portfolios of photo enthusiasts and advanced amateurs. You love landscape, so it's like landscape, 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 <laughs> landscape. You know, or it's bird, bird, bird. Burr. You know, mix it up. Uh, so we're talking about wide establishing shots, the landscapes, the, the look of the land, medium views, um, uh, street scenes, that kind of a thing. Portraits, whether it's of your animals or your, your, your fellow travelers or the people that you, uh, the indigenous people that you meet uh, uh, in these places. Close up and detail shots, very, very important for this new uh, medium because it's, it's especially in video, and we'll, we'll go into this a little later, uh, it's an important way to, to pace a narrative. And um, point of view shots. What does it feel like to be in the boat, the small dugout canoe, when you're looking at the uh, uh, at the animals in, in, in the in the Amazon? So these five shots are uh, are, are something that uh, and pacing your your coverage this way is very very important. And the the, the best way to kind of get a sense of how visual stories are told is to take your favorite television show, not a not Dancing with the Stars or the the singing one, but uh, your narrative. TV show, Law and Order. Take that, watch an episode for 15 minutes with the sound turned down. Very important to turn down the sound, otherwise you're going to get lost in the story. And watch that show for 15 minutes and see how the director or the editor mixes up these, these shots. So, you know, you have that bump, bump. You know, there's the New York City skyline, wide establishing shot. Bump, bump. There's Lenny Briscoe and Detective Green walking down the street in the medium view. Bump, bump. Quick portrait, dead guy in the gutter. <laughs> bump, bump. You see the, you know, close up and detail shot. His, his, le his, uh, his neck has been, sh you know, slit. Bump, bump. Point of view of the corpse, Lenny Briscoe looking down saying, well, he's not having a good day. You know, and in the first 10 to 13 seconds of the show, they've gone five, st and you know, without, without even listening to the sound, you know the story. Because we're the most visually literate people that have ever lived on Earth. We, we have been inundated with television and movies since we were you know, in the womb. Um, so we know visual storytelling, and now we're gonna have to, as photographers, kind of bring this to our, um, um, to our work. And moments and behavior, you know, uh, cap capturing special moments or animal behavior. Um, you know, uh, I know I, I'm, I'm sensing what from, the, from what I picked up from the, the chatter just before we started that there's a lot of wildlife folks in here. And, you know, um, uh, moments and behavior is something that raises your, your wildlife photography to a next level because, you know, headshots of, of, of animals and stuff, very nice to have, you, you need them. But you got to go beyond that now. People have seen all the headshots they need to see of, of penguins and, and seals. Now let's see some behavior um, and, and moments. So let, let's, um, 
So on this little uh, five-day cruise up the, the Amazon, um, you know, we're just gonna, I'm gonna go through some of the still shots, and then we're gonna look at a, a three-minute audio-visual uh, audio slideshow of how it's put together. But basically, you know, we have a, a mixture of wide establishing shots, um, giving an idea of, of what it's like to be there. We have some medium views, some of the kids from the villages that we're, that we're at. Um, you know, one thing when you're shooting kids or small animals, get down low. Get down to their um, uh, viewpoint. Um, I was talking to a young lady here who's thinking of going to the Galapagos. She was asking me what equipment she needed. I have a 70 to 300, do I need a longer lens? I said, no, really, that's, that's long enough. But what you do need when you go to the Galapagos, knee pads knee pads because you're going to be on hard jagged lava and you can get nose to nose with marine iguanas and um, and the thing is get down to their level to make it effective so so there's your first takeaway if you go to the Galapagos buy knee pads um, medium view street scenes the village scenes um, point of view we're on the boat we're looking at what we're seeing from the boat um, so POV, they call it in the, vi in the video world. So uh, we're, we're mixing up the shots, tight portraits, you know, um, get down on, on their level, fill the frame. I mean, there's such simple stuff to, to, to good photography. Uh, you're not looking down, you're getting up close, filling the frame, and you're letting the eyes do the talking. Portraits, twofers as we call them. Tight storytelling details. Very, very important, especially in these audio slideshows. You know, a detail shot in and of itself, uh, uh, hanging on the wall, is not going to be of, of real interest. But as a pace, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that uh, breaks up the pace of your overall views and everything, and especially in video, very important to get the tight overall, uh, the tight storytelling details. And moments, the moment the hawk snatches the, the piranha from the water. You gotta be ready for this, and you gotta, you know, uh, you're gonna miss a lot of them. Um, I know uh, one reason I, don't, I, I do um, more people than wildlife is that I really prefer to direct my subjects. And the damn hawks, they never listen to me, you know? <laughs> so uh, I'm definitely uh, uh, somebody who, uh, you know, uh, if I can't schmooze with my subject, I'm a little at a disadvantage. But, um, but a lot of the, the Limblad photographers live for this kind of stuff. They're, they're great, and they can teach you the, the, um, uh, the kind of reflexes and anticipation that you need. Moments. Sisters having a laugh at the big old fat Santa Claus with his camera, you know. Uh, uh, whenever I go to Latin America now, as I get older, I get Santa Claus all the time. And I use it. I use it to my advantage. First, it stabs me in the heart. And then, um, and then I'm able to use that energy to relax the kids and, and I run with it. Whatever works. Whatever works. Moments. Just, you know, birds in flight and everything. You shoot, you know, my average is about a million and a half before one get, comes out sharp, but you know, with digital, that's not much. Um, now, a couple of things that are really necessary, and I, you know, I'm not a big equipment, can I say this in the middle of B&H? I'm not a real equipment freak. Um, I've reached a point in life where I can actually afford to buy any piece of equipment that I really want. The thing is, I can't afford to carry it. I'm too old and my, my back is so bad so so it's a it's a kind of exquisite place that I'm in where I can buy it but do I'm not gonna buy it unless I can carry it and use it and and um, uh, but the one thing that I will uh, recommend to you is a digital voice recorder a decent digital voice recorder unfortunately the ones that I have these Olympuses have just been discontinued and they have not really been replaced but um, uh, uh, Samson or zoom makes good ones uh, Tascam makes good ones if you're interested in this, I'm sure that David uh, at the end can kind of uh, point you to, or to uh, some of the, the real good ones, but Zoom and Tascam are the thing. And you can see how small it is. There's an SD card, there's a little uh, um, uh, set of earphones. It's, it doesn't add a lot of weight to your bag. Now, as photographers, as visual communicators, we tend to poo poo audio. It's like, huh, it's just sound, right? But audio, when we're doing these things, is much more important than you think. Uh, people will forgive terrible, terrible visuals, but not bad audio. If you can't hear, if it's scratchy and stuff, you stop watching that YouTube, whatever it is. But if it's like a, you know, if it's if it's got decent audio and 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 bad video, 
you'll put up with it. But, um, but the ideal is to have, of course, good audio and good visuals. But, uh, but so audio is very important. Um, when, we're do when we're doing um, something for these audio slideshows, there's layers, layers of audio. There's ambient sound, the sound of the jungle in, in the Amazon. There's music that helps move along uh, these things. There's voiceover narration. There's interviews with your naturalists or, your, or the, the people that, uh, that you're photographing. So, so there's layers of audio that go there. Most important thing to remember when you're working one of these is get the microphone close. Look what the video guy did to me here today. He's got now, um, this, this lav mic is what? Four inches, three inches from my mouth. He's going to get good video. He's going to hear me breathing heavy. He's going to hear everything because the mic is nice and close. So that's, that's a, a, a very important thing. And uh, some other quick tips for audio, buy a good audio recorder. Always monitor with earphones. Uh, you'll be able to hear the, um, the air conditioning going uh, in the background and you'll be able to adjust for that. You'll be able to hear things that you can't hear just with the little tinny speakers that come on these uh, things. Wind is your enemy. Buy the dead cat. Um, the dead cat are those big fuzzy microphone covers that you see. Very, very important because you get this <laughs> without it. Uh, so most of these uh, uh, recorders offer an optional windscreen. Buy it. It's worth it. Get a good shotgun type microphone to augment your recorder's mics. We'll talk about this a little later. And if you're using music, always license or get permission to use the music. Don't steal it. You know, we're photographers, we're visual artists. We hate it. We hate it when some website rips off our pictures, don't we? Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've kind of stumbled across. I have a Google search on my name, and um, I have my name embedded in all my things, and all of a sudden I'm seeing my, my pictures of the Philadelphia skyline being used by a Philadelphia law firm on their website with no credit, no contact, no money for, for me. Uh, so we hate it. We hate it when we get ripped off. So let's not rip off our fellow uh, musical artists. Uh, there's a number of places that you can you can actually write to the band or whatever to get permission, or you can buy royalty-free music. It's pretty cheap, just like royalty-free photography. Uh, Vimeo, which is the on, uh, online um, uh, video site, has a music store. You can license uh, great music for personal use for $1.99. So you know, don't rip off the musicians. So let's look at uh, this story of the, um, of the Amazon. It's multi-layered audio, and uh, it's about three, three, three and a half minutes long. approximately 68 miles down to Iquitos, but approximately 2,400 miles away from the Atlantic Ocean heading down the Amazon. Get ready because our wet and wild adventure is about to begin. Our ship, La Amatista, is based on the design of the river coast used by the robber barons in the late 19th century. We will be navigating the Ucayali and Marañón rivers, two of the main tributaries of the Amazon. These rivers form the boundaries of the Bacaya Samiria National Reserve, the largest protected wetland in the world, covering an area of over 5 million acres. is the red belly giraffe. Look at those teeth. They have sharp teeth, very sharp. And that's why they are called the flesh eaters. You don't want to put your finger on this guy. Visiting the villages of the people who live along the river is a good way to gain some insight into their lives. We'll observe them fishing and farming. Visit the schools 
and from each supplies to the students. and witnessed firsthand its beauty and its importance to the ecosystem of the entire world, it is easy to understand why we must preserve it. So I actually shot that on assignment for an Australian... Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're very kind. Um, I actually shot that on assignment for an uh, Australian travel magazine. The printed uh, piece used 14 pictures. The three and a half minute slideshow used what? 50? So you get more of your work out there, they put it on their website, they, they got actually a ton of hits on the website because of it, and, and I had a lot of fun and um, you know, um, a lot of times uh, your, your success or failure on some of these things really uh, uh, depends on the quality of the uh, Number one, the naturalists that you have on board and how well they can speak. And this is another thing that Limblad does so well. You know, uh, you, you really get these top flight guys and they're so used to presenting. They're, they should all host their own wildlife show, you know. Um, but, um, but, you know, that was uh, 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 crickets, you know, interviews. Um, we, we went out in the middle of the night everybody turned off their their lights everything and we just sat silently for three minutes and I was able to just get the sound of the jungle um, uh, you know as a base for that whole thing and um, it's a it's uh, to me it's a it's a great way of um, of um, adding texture to our work and especially if we're sharing our work you know keeping keeping our audiences kind of awake um, interviews are a big part of of this new media, you know, whether you're talking to the, the naturalist or, or somebody. And some quick tips for interviews. Uh, we're not, you know, on, we're not Robert Siegel on all things considered, so our voices will not be in the, vo in the thing. So ask your subject to repeat the question because your voice will be edited out. It's not radio, nor are you the host. So, so um, you know, if you say, how long have you been a naturalist on the Amazon? The, 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 the answer is 10 years. Well, 10 years does you nothing, but I've been an, uh, a naturalist on the Amazon for 10 years now. Uh, you know, you, you ask them to repeat, you know, to build in the question to, to, the, to the response. Ask open-ended, not yes or no questions. Do you like being a naturalist on the, on the, on the Amazon? See, you know, <laughs> that's, not a, that's not something you can use. Why is it important to show tourists the Amazon? Well, because we need to preserve it. We need this, we need that. So you ask open-ended questions. And we all know how to do this. How many of you guys listen to NPR? Yeah, look, I, I knew you'd be an NPR crowd. You hear some great interviews all the time. You, you, know, you, know, you know how it's done. We, know, you know, we, we get all this stuff by osmosis, and it's not until we do it ourselves that we have to kind of break it down into um, uh, you know, step by step. But we know, we know how they do it. Find a quiet place. If all else fails, sit in a car, which is pretty fairly soundproof. And um, it's better than a big room. Um, you, you get that echoey audio. So, so um, uh, try to find a quiet place. And you're going to see from some upcoming videos I'm going to show you that uh, the, the uh, sub-theme of this is do as I say, not as I do, because I've gotten caught in some pretty um, loud places. And when you're talking to somebody, don't be afraid of silences. Something will happen. 
Sometimes um, my, my mentor in all this has been my very good friend, a guy I've known for almost 30 years, Bob Sasha. We just had dinner with him last night. He's a great uh, National Geographic photographer who's gone completely over to the multimedia world and now shoots videos for NGOs and stuff like that. And um, he just came from a workshop uh, teaching uh, in Western Kentucky and he, he said this one student went off to do a little thing on what she thought was going to be a local lady who shot who liked to shoot wildlife and she fell silent during the interview and ended up getting this interview about how this lady struggles with her alcoholism every day and how the photography helps her to get through it and it you know just by letting the lady just sit there she she can't she went to do get a kind of a little surfacey story and came back with this very moving story just by keeping her mouth shut and you know um, so don't be too afraid of silences uh, something will happen um, now not every story uh, gives you these great visuals I had an idea uh, a couple years ago when the financial crisis hit it hit us I, I pitched us uh, I, I was going down to my wife's family reunion in Texas and I was looking at the map and I noticed that we were going past a place called Paris and I said Paris Texas you know I knew Wim Vendors made a, a, a film about it but uh, so I, I came up with this idea, you know, uh, uh, one of the ways you survive as a photographer in the editorial world is anybody can take pictures. Uh, everybody takes pictures. As they used to say uh, down at National Geographic, we're up to our, our eyeballs and talent, but we're only ankle deep in story ideas. So um, I'm always thinking of story ideas. And, and seeing this Paris on the map, I said, you know what, let's do, let's do a recession travel thing. Let's do uh, around the world in 50 states. Let's go to places like Moscow, Idaho, and Paris, Texas, and do little little things. And and you know because who's going to be able to afford to go to the real Paris pretty soon if uh, if things keep on going the way they're going? And you know the editor of the magazine looked at me and said, "You're out of your mind." You know, but the blog uh, editor said, "That's a good idea. Do do some little audio slideshow." So I went down to the reunion a couple days earlier. I went to Paris, Texas, and God, there was nothing there to shoot. But there were some really interesting people and everything. So this is another little three-minute story. It was from a, a, a series that unfortunately was stillborn. <laughs> After we did Paris, they didn't want to do. They didn't want to spend the money to do Moscow and uh, and uh, Rome and uh, and all these other places. Uh, and I wasn't going there. So um, anyway, so if I was going to go there, they'd run them. But they weren't going to pay for my expenses to get there. So anyway, this is uh, Paris, Texas. It's um, a story with multi-layered audio multiple interviews, just okay visuals, but really interesting audio, so. You know, the folks in Paris, France, just can't beat what we've got here in Paris, Texas. The Eiffel Tower, it has a red hat on it. It's 65 feet high. And so people come from all over to see our Eiffel Tower, our famous Texanized Eiffel Tower. Well, you know, the other Paris is known for its wine and its cafes. Well, we have Paris Bakery. Uh, I don't know this firsthand, but I've been told that my chocolate croissants are better than the ones in Paris, France. Uh, I use more chocolate. I guess everything's bigger and better in Texas. <laughs> And then Matt over at the Paris Vineyards can give you a wonderful bottle of wine made right here in Paris, Texas. French wines are going to be a bit drier than Texas wines. Uh, in Texas, we like our wines like we like our women, nice and sweet. Evergreen Cemetery is huge. It's got so many beautiful monuments that are so old, back in the 1700s even. In fact, there's a statue of Jesus with cowboy boots. Do you want to know why he's got cowboy boots on? The family hired a sculptor to do the monument and he passed away. So they had to hire another sculptor. Well, he didn't know how to do feet and sandals, so he did a cowboy boot. Then we have the Sam Bell Maxey House, General Sam Bell Maxey with the Civil War. Has a beautiful home here built in the 1800s and it survived the Great Fire of 1916. In fact, it stopped at the back fence and it's a museum today. We have the Hayden Art Museum of American Art, just a hidden treasure. We had been collecting things for probably the mid-1950s, 
So we started that, and then the next thing you know, we had more pictures than we knew what to do with. They were under the beds and in the closets and stuff like that, you see. The museum is a history of American art. Now that embraces paintings, sculptures, uh, and uh, chairs, American chairs, and archival photography. Y'all, let's just doodle here for a minute, kind of getting warmed up. We founded this building in Paris about three years ago, and it was an old abandoned machine shop and a, a postery shop, and we decided we needed a place to play music, and this is something that we thought Paris, Texas needed, and the four of us uh, purchased this old building as a place to come and set up our sound and practice and open the doors, and here they came. So we are, we're just tickled to death that this many people enjoy what we've got going here. In comparison to this Paris, Texas, to Paris, France, I can't give you a comparison, but they're missing out something not being in Paris, Texas. This is where we love bluegrass music. We don't have wine, but we've got good water. And uh, we have green grass, and we have lovely folks, and we're very hospitable, and we're Texas, and, and that, that's what makes it great. I've traveled to over 140 countries, and no country is stranger to me than Texas. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, so um, that, that, you know, it was one of the most, s the s strangest two days I've spent on a, on a job, but it was very interesting and uh, um, um, I, 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 liked, I liked it a lot. Um, so one way that we share our, our work is with slideshows. And when you say the word slideshows to people over a certain age, you, you start thinking of your, your dad's carousel projector, you know, the, we used to call it the clunk show. Slide clunks down, slide comes up. So, but they're not your, your, your father's carousel clunkers anymore. You can put in interesting uh, transitions, dissolves, fades, wipes, um, the Ken Burns effect, animating the still image, dragging the camera, you know, moving a camera over a still image is what Ken Burns did because he had trouble finding good video of the Civil War. So, um, oh boy, come on. <laughs> come on, this is a New York crowd. Okay, it's, it's 10.30. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, you know, he, he perfected this move uh, of moving over a still uh, photograph. Uh, we can do that now, animating the still image just with, um, with um, uh, uh, our, our slideshow uh, programs, soundtracks, music narration, ambient sound. You can now put to YouTube or Vimeo, Flash for websites, DVD for TV viewing. This is, um, this is, uh, these slideshow programs are, are phenomenal. Most browsers will do a simple slideshow, but these can add sound as well. Be sure to check platform, PC or Mac compatibility. Photo to movie is a very powerful kind of unknown program for about 50 bucks. It's, it's almost like Final Cut Express. It's very good, it's, it's dual platform. Uh, it's lqgraphics.com. Uh, you can use it for the Mac or the PC. Sound Slides Plus was developed by journalists, um, four photojournalists who had to create these audio slideshows for the newspaper um, websites very quickly. Uh, it's a very easy to understand program. It's, it's, it's also dual platform. Photo Magico is a very elegant uh, Mac-only thing out of Germany um, that uh, also will al allow you to uh, put in movie clips. It's a very, very, it's got that OS X beautiful interface that we Mac lovers uh, so prize. Um, PC-only Pro Show Gold and of course iMovie 11 is a, is a really good uh, way to put um, uh, slideshows together. So, so uh, put, you know, using any of these programs to put your stuff together in a, in a presentation is a, a good way. Now one thing that you can do, they have so many transitions, is you can start to really drive your audience crazy, you know, and um, I went, I was out in Moab, Utah, and Tom Till, who's um, one of the foremost 4x5 um, uh, landscape photographers in the country was having a show of pictures from his latest book and Tom is uh, he's phenomenal he's he's one of these guys David Munch you know he's like Ansel Adams in color well Keynote had just come out with uh, or Apple had just come out with Keynote and, t and in Keynote there's about 40 transitions you can put things on fire sparkles and this, uh, so Tom <laughs> Tom had a different transition in between each picture and the minute the lights come up the audience is like what program did you use? What program did you use? Because the program, the, the show became more about the transitions and the fancy stuff than about his stunning photography. So be careful of that. Don't let the, the software outshine you. Um, um, editing sound, 
um, is is kind of like uh, editing. Uh, it looks kind of like a histogram on its side, doesn't it? Um, so what what we have are these sound waves here. Um, uh, this is actually a movie, but I'm not I'm not going to bore you with a three minute thing on editing sound. But but here and here. It's like a clipped histogram. The sound's too loud. So we want to keep our sound you know, somewhere in the middle. It's just like your histogram, um, only it's on its side here. So when you see this, this is uh, the rough equivalent of a clipped highlight. The sound has gotten so loud and stuff. So we can try to uh, tone it down or whatever. So um, uh, the, the thing is, you know, um, to try to keep your sound well balanced, just like your histograms, uh, uh, so, so you don't go out beyond the recorder's capability of recording it. Um, so what I'll do is I'll go through and I'll um, do something like this um, and then um, you know kind of regulate the sound it's like taking your raw converter and and making your JPEGs and now uh, putting a soundtrack together here um, this is Apple's um, uh, garage band and I've got the male voice I've got the speaker I've got um, a, a track here for the music. Uh, if, I, if I had something, um, if I had ambient sound, I'd have another track. You put all this together, uh, you can balance, you know, you can make it that the, the other two tracks come down when your speaker comes up. It's a whole Megillah, you know, it's a whole thing, uh, uh, a whole nother software suite to learn. But if you've worked in digital media before, it's not that unusual, it's not that different from your uh, Adobe Camera Raw, your Lightroom, your, your Aperture, whatever you use to, to process your, um, your um, uh, pictures. And then combining your, your soundtrack and your images together, this is a screenshot from uh, Photo Magico. Um, you know, you have the, 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 the soundtrack down there and you've got the, the slides laid out there and you can, you can uh, determine how much, how long each time, uh, each slide stays up and everything like that. So it's, it's um, I'm not going to kid you, it's time consuming and so far um, nobody, um, nobody has really figured out how to make it um, uh, financially worth the time you put in. But if you think this is a lot of work for a three minute slideshow, just wait until you try video. And there's one of those fancy transitions. And kiss any life you have out of outside photography, goodbye. Um, I started shooting video about a year and a half ago. I'm still struggling to learn the, the, um, um, the editing of it. But it has been, uh, um, it's, it's set me on fire, literally. I'm, I'm so jazzed by it, uh, again, because of the storytelling things. And I started just using the video capabilities built into my Nikon. Started with the D90, now I have the D7000. Although my pet camera for, for shooting video, pet Nikon, is the D5100. It's the smaller, cheaper, more amateur version, but it has a flip out screen. And it has actually, I think, uh, since it's a newer camera, more frame rates and choices and everything there. But a few tips about video. Should you s decide to uh, abandon all hope and, um, and give up your life, um, learn to love your tripod. If you don't use a tripod a lot in your still work, as I don't, I mean, I will take the tripod for, for long lens stuff, for twilight stuff. I was always a great proponent of, of, of hand holding. It is incredibly important with video to have a steady camera. There is nothing that says I'm an amateur videographer more than this kind of shaking stuff. And unless you're a kid making a music video, somehow you know they like all that shaky stuff. But uh, but for the rest of us, um, you know, learn to love your tripod. Learn the five shots, and we'll talk about the five shots. Not too uh, dissimilar than those those cinematographers terms I was telling you before. Um, Shoot a ton of close-ups and cutaways. You simply, when you're editing, you cannot have too many close-ups. You can't be too rich, too thin, or have too many close-ups in video. Uh, um, so um, master your audio, it's so important. So um, what are the five shots, anyway? A close-up of the action. And this is general. I mean, it doesn't apply to every situation, but this is a general thing. Close-up of the action, a close-up of the reaction to the action, or a close-up of who is conducting the action. So, you know, if you're starting off a story about a shoemaker or something, you start off with a shot of his hands, then you go up to his face, you know. Um, point of view of the, of, the per, uh, of the person conducting the action. You shoot over the shoemaker's shoulders to show his hands sewing the, the shoe. Um, a, sh a wide shot establishing where the action is taking place. And 
creative beauty shot that ties into the action and more close-ups. So every time as a, uh, you go into a situation, you're looking to make these five shots. And this really goes for whether you're shooting uh, for a slideshow or video. Uh, and let's take a look at um, a sample sequence. I just did um, a video about this uh, music camp for inner city kids from Camden, New Jersey. And this is just a small section of it where, you're sh where we're showing a lesson of a kid who's gone on to college coming back to teach a kid who has, who's, who's in high school. And you'll just see how the sequencing works, the, the different shots. This is like uh, 40 seconds. Seeing Alexander Cummings play after he had been at Oberlin for two years now. He's going into his junior year. And I remember starting Alex when he was a little kid, little long arm kid walking in the, the band room. He's a, a, a testament to, you know, what it is you can do after hard work. And after hard work, you will be rewarded. You know, after he's traveled to China, performed with Stevie Wonder, he took time out to pay it forward and come back to the camp this summer and work with the kids. So there you saw, um, you know, the overall shot, close-up of the face, close-up of the hands, uh, you know, close-up of the student's face. You know, you're just breaking every situation down into sequences. The biggest problem for travel photographers is that a place isn't necessarily a story. And, and this is really important when you're, when you're going on a tour um, uh, um, to, to really kind of slow down. We Americans tend to want to go too damn fast. You know, if it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium. And that's why if you, if you, you know, um, if you tour and everything, I, you know, um, from my days of shooting for the, the magazines right on, on through, um, you know, go to fewer places but stay longer. That's how the quality of photography happens. So, um, so you know, again, you know, a, a Limblad tour. You know, you're going to be they're going to they're going to get you to the right place at the right time for the photography. You're going to have uh, some uh, photographers helping you, but but try to avoid these things where you're going to 12 countries in in nine and a half days. You know. Take your time because place isn't necessarily a story. The, your journey could be a story, uh, but the, but place, you know, it, it somehow isn't. You know, um, uh, the, the the editor of National Geographic tells me, you know, if he had a dime for every call or email he, he got that that a pitch story pitch that says this, I'm going to Paris. Anything I can do for you there? Well, I never thought of Paris as, uh, as a story thing, you know. That's not a story. Paris is not a story. The, um, the street musicians of Paris is a story. The food markets of Paris is a story. Uh, you know, but Paris is not a story. So, so when you're, you know, uh, w one of the things when I was leaving the newspaper and coming up into freelancing, one of the things that really improved my work was when I started thinking about shooting for story and becoming more proactive and less reactive. So many people think that travel photography is kind of like this, this thing where you kind of, you're walking along, sipping your wine, and you say, oh, there's a perfect scene. Oh, I shall photograph that with my Leica M9. And, and you, you take the picture and you, you go back and it's like, oh, what a great existence. It's like, no, that is not travel photography. Inspiration is for amateurs. You go out, when you go out for a National Geographic, you got a shot list that you've made, a category, you got stories, you're, you're hunting, you're looking, you're creating situations if they don't already exist. This business about kind of sitting back and waiting for inspiration, uh-uh, uh-uh. Now, you know, one of the reasons that travel photography is so uh, popular is that you can't help but go to the Galapagos and f and be, you know, react to things. I mean, there's so much put in front of you, uh, and, and that's great. But when you go to some place where, where it's not that way, you've got to be a little more proactive. But um, let's take a, a, a quick look at a sample short that I did recently.
you guys. Yeah. How long did it take you to edit the post-production piece of this? That took a couple days, yeah. Um, and But you noticed that there was no story to that. It was because that was shot on assignment for a tour company that, that is not Lindblad. And we were only up there for two days. Now, Lindblad's running a trip there next year that's going up for two weeks. And then you could dig up stories. I couldn't interview anybody. I, could, I just had to react because I was going to be there for two days. Yeah, can we... Uh, one more question, then let's hold it to the end, otherwise I'm going to get derailed. But Okay, I, I just, when you're gathering stills and audio, either interviews or ambient sound, can you say a little bit about how you manage collecting the both? Yes, let me, let me hold that off sure. and I'll answer that question first when we, when we stop. I got one more thing to, we're almost near the end of the, the, this and we're ready to take Q&A, but I don't want to get derailed. The solution just might be in addition to going touring, to just go to one place, stay longer, and dig for a real story. Now this, you know, yes, it's easy for me to say because I've been 30 years on the road, uh, and, and now this is my new kind of modus operandi. I want to tell stories. I've been, I don't want to say I've been everywhere, but I've been a lot of places, and now I want to dig down, and I've met a lot of interesting people in these places, and sometimes I've had time there, and sometimes I've had to rush through. Um, and, but my new little uh, self-assigned projects are, are to do these things. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to monetize them, um, uh, but uh, that's, you know, that, that'll come eventually. But um, um, one of the first thing that I did was I went back to an ancestral village where my mother's family goes back multiple generations in England, and I just, I got myself a little uh, uh, cottage uh, pretty cheaply, and I stayed for almost a month. And I had covered this place for magazine stories and stuff before, and I had met uh, an old fisherman back in the early 90s when he was 70. And I went back last spring, and um, I met up with him again. Um, and uh, we did a, a little video that I'm going to uh, share with you. But, um, but I mentioned my, my good friend Bob Sasha. Um, uh, he's got a great little mem or meme or here about and you know trying to analyze whether what you want to photograph has good story potential um, and I call it Bob Sasha's five-point analysis character is there a main character through which the story can be told is this person interesting and able to communicate the story are there supporting people who can help corroborate and support the main character story arc is there a process with a beginning middle and end that's uh, a very, very uh, interesting thing. Visuals. Is there a process through which the characters are going that's visible and visual? Can it be seen? You know, um, it's a little tough to photograph enlightenment through Zen meditation because it's, you know, it's a one-shot deal. It's a guy sitting there maybe getting hit with a stick every once in a while. But, that, you know, so, so when you're analyzing what you're going to throw your time into, you, you know, you look at the, these kind of things. Access. Will they allow you to witness the process? Can you physically get close enough to record the story? Um, uh, that's a real important thing. It's getting harder and harder to get access to things. And finally, time. Do you have enough time to witness and film the evolution of the process? So, so now these are the things that I use that I try to apply to any subject that I think I want to make a, a, a short video story about. If you have these five elements, the potential for a good story exists. I'll, I'll take questions. I'm going to start with this gentleman's question because he waited so patiently. And your question was... Um, when you're gathering still images, and sound. And audio. Um, how do I coordinate um, um, still images and sound? Well, uh, every night when I'm downloading my stuff, I have, um, you know, the, uh, I'll download, you know, uh, my sound recorder uses SD cards just like my cameras. I download them into folders by day. And then I'll just list, give a, a, a quick listen to um, the sound and I'll rename it. You know, it, it has a, a file name like LS Wave 0033 LS Wave. Uh, I'll, I'll rename it and I'll call it Bill Interview or, or, or something like that. And, uh, and so I keep the sound in a folder and then the daily takes in a folder. Bob, what I actually meant was when you're actually on the site, how do you manage? Ah, ah, good question. Good rules? question. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, um, uh, if you're just getting some ambient sound, um, you, you just do that. If you're doing an interview, it's, it's kind of hard. Um, I have been uh, training my lovely wife of 37 years as being an audio engineer. So she, uh, she has been pretty good about, uh, she's gotten pretty good about uh, gathering sound and everything. The, that is the big problem. You've hit upon the problem of new media. 
you've hit on, you've hit on it. There's too much for one person to do. You know, it's no, it's, it's no wonder why we used to refer to video crews and photographers. As a, as a still photographer, one person you could do a, you know, professional photography. But for video and, and multimedia, so you have to be smart about it. I'll, um, I'll often keep the, the recorder in a little adapter right on the hot shoe and just, just hit it and have it going. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, because sound recordings don't take up that much time. So if I'm going through a fishing mark, a fish market or whatever, I'll just have the sound going. Um, that's when I'm shooting audio, uh, a video, because the video doesn't make any sound, you know, because you don't want the sound of your shutter going. Or what I'll often do is, let's say you are going to do um, uh, an audio slideshow about a fish market. Uh, you, I would get your shots first and then go through and just go through for sound, you know, the, sh the, sh the sounds of, of guys chopping on a chopping board, uh, the sounds of people calling out and stuff like that. Um, uh, the problem is, and you've, you've hit upon it, the problem is it's a lot for one person to do. But we're all being asked to do more right now. I mean, we, we text while we drive, we drink coffee, we put on our makeup, we text, you know. So uh, shooting pictures and, uh, and gathering audio is just one of the many multitasking uh, things that are required of us in the brave new world. Yes, ma'am. Well, there's a little graph on the, on the outside, and um, uh, you can see immediately, you know, it's like, it's like taking a test shot and checking your histogram. It takes about as much time to get, to get a level with your audio recorder once you get to know it as it does to take a test shot, check your histogram, and then keep shooting. And then you keep yeah, yeah. And then you've got to worry about, you know, some clapping or some big loud spike of sound. That's your biggest enemy in audio is, you know, you're, you're going through, you get a level, and then all of a sudden somebody yells or, or there's a backfire of a car and you get this big, but you know, there's not much you can do about it. Can you, edit it later? you can clip the high, you can, yeah, you can bring it down a little later, but it's just like in, in, in visual, it's best not, it's best to ideally get all your information in between that, the, the, the ends of your histogram. Same thing with audio. But audio, I think, presents a little more of a ability. Like we can't, when we clip a highlight, we can't put pixels back in there. But you can clip, you know, if, if sound is clipped, you can quiet it down a little bit. Yes? Um, you mentioned the importance of being light while traveling. Um, what, what gear do you carry when you travel? Like specifically, what lenses? Do okay. Carry? And also, what lens do you use when you film? When you use video? Okay, my, my normal uh, travel kit um, is two um, D7000s, Nikon D7000s, or these days, one D7000, one D5100. And then I only have maybe about, well, I only carry usually about three lenses, but I have, I usually take along five. I take um, um, either the 12 to 24 or an 11 to 16 for the wide, a 16, the 16 to 85 in the core, the 70 to 300 in the core. And I do most of my stuff with the 70 to 300 and the 16 to 85. I also have a 3518 and an 8518 that I'll, that I'll carry. Uh, and I do most, I'd say probably 90% of what I do, I do with that. Now I am fooling around a little with um, uh, the Sony NEX camera, the little NEX5. Uh, you, I put my Nikon lenses on, it's very tiny, gives very good audio, um, very good video rather, it has more video choices than my Nikon has. But I travel very light and I use, I mean I have 85 14s I have all the expensive 2.8 zooms and you know if I have an assistant or I'm going on a big commercial job where I'm supposed to look like I know what I'm doing, I'll, I'll take all the, the bigger lenses and everything. But when I'm out on a boat or doing this stuff, you know that um, the Cornwall thing was shot almost entirely with the 16 to 85 and a couple of 75 and the 35. The interview of him sitting in his uh, living room was the 35 1.8. So I, I travel and I use what would be considered amateur equipment. Um, but uh, it, it holds up for me. It's lightweight. I can stand up straight at the end of the day. I'm, I'm going to be 60 uh, starting about I dodged a back surgeon at the age of 54. For the last, from 54 to now, I've, I've really uh, run into problems with arthritis and spinal stenosis and all that other stuff. So I, at that age, I said, I either have to 
be so successful that I can afford a full-time assistant, whether, you know, or I have to lighten my camera bag. And that's when I started exploring the smaller uh, variable aperture zooms and stuff like that, things that I used to eschew, you know, and say, Phew, you know, when I was younger. But it was, if it's a choice of being able to stand up straight for four hours a day with f2.8 zooms, or being able to work 12 hours a day with variable aperture zooms, you know, uh, so, so you got to gauge yourself there. Yes, ma'am. With this last piece that you did, which is a documentary, have you thought about uh, using it that, in a way that it can be effective in the area and, and make people more aware of what happened? I'm, I'm actually, the BBC is doing a whole series on uh, Cornish uh, fishing, and uh, we're, we're negotiating now for them to use this on their website. Um, so they've seen it. Uh, people in England can understand what the guy is saying most of the time. <laughs> he has that thick Cornish, that thick Cornish brogue. And so, yeah, yeah there will be. See, I, you know, I've always believed right from the very beginning of my career that if you do good work, try to do the good work, and then you'll figure out a way to monetize it. And it's worked that way all, all the way along. And right now, I'm in my infancy as a videographer, so I'm, I'm much more interested in producing the work and then trying to find a market for it. But it is, it is true. Okay, this gentleman uh, has. What do you use for a slide pan tripod? You, you've got a lot of slides. Uh, um, I have a very short um, glide track uh, slider. It's, it's about this uh, big. And I have um, a, a Manfrotto, I think it's a 501 head on a Gitzo Traveler tripod, and I put that. I put the slider on there, and then I used the lightest camera I have, which was the 5100 or the Sony NEX5, which are very small cameras, and you can just push them along there. Now, I've since bought a longer slider and a bigger tripod head, but I only do that when I'm working locally or out of my car or I have an assistant or whatever. I'm, I'm developing two sets of video gear, gear that I fly with and go off to with smaller tripod, everything's smaller. And then I have some bigger gear for when I'm working domestically or driving and I have an assistant or whatever like that. Yes, sir? From a legal standpoint, how do you work with model releases that you're shooting with people and your crowd scenes? And then the flip side of that is once you start posting online, how do you maintain your copyright and, and protect your images? Two good questions. Uh, model releases, um, uh, I don't worry as much about model releases as I should. Um, and, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I've been an editorial photographer for, you know, since 1976. And, is this wood? Um, I've been approached a couple times, but the, the, the First Amendment does a great job. Uh, if, it's, if it's editorial usage, you don't really need a model release. National Geographic doesn't require a model release. None of the magazines I did uh, uh, work for require a model release because it's considered editorial usage and it's protected by the freedom of the press. What, where it gets sticky with any of your work is, let's say, let's say Nikon sees this video and says, wow, we want to promote the video stuff. We want to buy that or we want to use that to promote our cameras. Now you've crossed over usage from editorial to promotional and everybody should be covered with a model release. Uh, did I get a model release from old Bill Cowan? No, I didn't. Uh, I just, he's such a nice old guy and this is my fault. I should have gotten it, uh, but I didn't because I felt like I'd, uh, he let me into his life. You know, he, he was a little nervous about me filming him and everything, and I, and I didn't do, I didn't follow through. Um, so, um, but keep in mind that just because you get paid for your pictures doesn't mean it, it's a promotional use. So if you have a gallery show in your hometown or whatever, and you've got pictures um, of people in there and you sell a print, that's still personal, that's still, you know, personal use. It's not, it's not whether or not you get paid, it's how the picture is used. Is it being used in a promotional manner or is it being used in, in an editorial manner? So since most of my work is editorial, um, uh, I haven't worried about it. Um, but you know, I think if, if I had worried about it, I'd be driving a Mercedes and not a Hyundai today. <laughs> um, as far as being ripped off, I really don't know. You know, when, I, when, when websites were in their infancy and I first went, 
I said, you know, they, you got to have a website. I told my designer, make them small and don't make them too sharp because I don't want anybody to rip it off. That's kind of like old world thinking. So I'd have these little pictures come up and they wouldn't be sharp and it looked like I was like the world's best myopic travel photographer, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so um, I think, you know, you can put up your copyright warnings and stuff like that. But, you know, in the, in the distilling business, they have a term called TRET. And TRET is the amount of booze that evaporates into the air that you cannot recover. And I think we all have to face the fact that there's going to be certain amount of TRET in our, in our, our work is going to get ripped off here and there. Uh, what you want to prevent is blatant, massive ripoff. And I'm not sure uh, other than um, uh, doing a Google search on your name or there are certain, uh, there are certain services like TinEye, I think it is, that will send out, they'll take digital fingerprints of your pictures and then they send these spiders out over the, over the web. I did, I hired a service like that for a year and I kept waiting for the dollars to roll in, you know, and, and, the, and every month they'd say, no, we have no, and after about four months, I, I put in, uh, this is when I learned to do Google search, I put in Bob Christ images, and I found all kinds of my images. And I went back to the service and I said, I'd like a refund, please, because you missed these things that I got by just putting my name into a search engine, you know? So I'm, I'm, a, I'm not so sanguine about those, uh, about those services. They may have gotten better, but in, in, when they first came out, they were useless. Yes, ma'am. I try to register my copyrights about once a year. Um, you know, I'm not, what's that? Yeah, well, you know, I'm pretty bad about it too. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I miss. But here's the reason why you want to, the question was, do I register, do you register? You have two levels of copyright protection. By putting the C in the circle next to your name, you are afforded copyright protection just like that but you have only actual damages that you can collect should somebody infringe. If you go the extra mile and you, um, and you um, what's the word, register your copyright, you know, you, and it's very easy to do. You can put thousands of pictures on a CD and fill out the forms. The, the Copyright Office, by the way, since the white powder incidents after 2001 are so far uh, behind in registering copyrights, so there's a, there's a whole another Megillah on that. Uh, yeah, it's all online. You do it on, yeah. Um, by, by registering the copyrights, then if there's an infringement, you're, you're uh, also liable to, I mean, you can sue for um, punitive as well as actual damages. So the th you can get a lot more per settlement. The problem is, um, do, you, do you take the time and everything? But, but just by putting the C next to it, you are afforded a certain level of copyright protection. And that's really, you know, I just don't have, I've been a one-man band, my wife and I have worked together for all these years, there's, there's two of us then, a two-man band, but we don't have time to like prosecute. We catch somebody, we send them a takedown notice, we send them a bill, you know, we, we, and, and you know, we, 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 we try to fight for our rights, but I, you know, there are certain photographers who have made second careers out of suing people. Um, uh, they shall go nameless, but some of us know who they are. Uh, uh, you know, whatever business keeps you afloat in this economy, uh, you know. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm more interested in your process. Do you do your, you pick up your music first, I would think, with that uh, last piece. And then do you do your interviews and then look for pictures to kind of um, coordinate the, with your interviews? The process of putting it together, um, so usually it's... Thinking, uh, which, com which comes first, the, the interviews, the pictures, or do you do it simultaneously? You, you kind of do it, in that case, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that footage was gathered over almost like a two and a half week period where actually my wife and I were supposed to be there on vacation and then I had my gear. I had just come off a, a, a different video shooting gig and, and then I saw old Bill who I had photographed 20 years ago and the whole thing started out of nowhere. So usually I think your visuals have to run it and then your interview uh, comes maybe second and uh, the music was just you, you know I've been listening to a lot of ambient music since I've gotten into video because it's real important to get the the, the right music and uh, the and then I worked with an editor on this one and and I had you know because this was just a little more complicated than I can handle with my primitive video editing skills so I worked with a guy down near where I live in Pennsylvania and he helped me to put it together uh, this is a process that I'm still learning um, uh, but, but basically for my audio slideshows, which I, uh, I'll do the soundtrack first and then lay the, the pictures over it. But, but you take the pictures first. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, you take the pictures first. You yeah. Don't storyboard before the no, no, uh, uh, um, because I have no control. I don't have enough control to storyboard. I wish, I, I wish once I had enough control to storyboard something. But, <laughs> but things are like you know I'm getting yanked here and yanked there. And can I go on the boat with you? Yeah, jump on. I'm like, whoa, okay, you know. Uh, so you know, uh, but storyboarding is what I think video professionals do when they're. You know, even even if they're they're just roughly thinking about it, you know. So um, again, um, me teaching you video is like being the substitute teacher who's one lesson ahead of the students in the in the in the textbook. Um, I'm sharing my experiences with you, but I'm not an expert, and I'm learning. And you know, um, I I figure I'm about 500 hours into my 10,000 hours of mastery. I'm I'm hoping I'll live long enough to get to 10,000 hours with this. Yeah, you. Yeah. Um, Security while traveling, very important uh, point. Um, you really have to watch your step uh, in certain places. Um, um, hotels, uh, for instance, um, uh, the most vulnerable time in a hotel. Uh, most of the time, your staff is trustworthy and everything. The most vulnerable time in the hotel is when the maid is in cleaning your room, because there's a there's a type of thievery. It's called dipping. Uh, you you walk up and down the halls of a hotel. You see the door open where the maid is. You come in. You say, Oh, I forgot my, oh, I forgot my camera. Thanks. Okay. Boom. Gone. So what I do for that in hotels, I pack up my gear and I lock it in my bags all the time. If I'm in a real dicey place, I lock the bag, I carry a little chain, and I lock the bag to the bed frame. But, uh, but basically what I'm looking to prevent in hotel rooms is uh, that, that, that real grabby thing where you, you walk in. Only in Las Vegas, and I think New York City's pretty good, is a maid trained to ask for ID or your room key. In, in the rest of the world, if you're uh, you know, a relatively respectable person, you walk into an open room and say, I forgot my, um, uh, my pen, you know, you, you, your pencil or something, but you, you look around, I forgot my laptop, damn, I won't, you know, and there's the laptop and it's out, it goes and the, and the maid is you know, there. So that's the, that's the most vulnerable point when you're, when you're in your hotel. When you're on the, on the streets in Buenos Aires or in, in, in Barcelona, you know, you gotta really you know, keep your bag zippered, keep it close to you. Um, it's really kind of hard to, to blend in. You have the equipment, no matter how down market you dress, they're gonna, the gypsies know that you're not another gypsy. You know, you, you could wear a black eyeliner and, you know, a, a, a kerchief. They know you're not a gypsy. They know you're a rich tourist with a camera. So you just got to be careful. Like, I did um, a story on Buenos Aires for National Geographic Traveler last year. And I hired what we call a fixer, a guy, a fixer is like a guide, uh, a street smart guide. And he turned out to be a real tall guy and he was a photographer. I found him by looking at websites of, of Buenos Aires photographers and he had an eye. And I contacted him, I said, would you like to work with me as my assistant and my fixer? And he was very security conscious. And what he would do is like when we went through the Sunday afternoon um, um, uh, antique market, he would stay five steps behind me and watch my back, literally watch my back as I, to make sure that nobody would reach in and stuff. I've been pretty lucky. I, the, uh, the worst thing that's happened to me uh, happened a couple years ago in St. Petersburg. I was walking down the Nevsky Prospect, which is uh, uh, their Fifth Avenue, and I had a sling bag and I didn't quite zipper close back there and I had my I had the bo one body with the 1685 around my neck, but the body with the 70 to 300 was in the sling bag. And, and this guy came up behind me and stiff-armed me and grabbed the camera out of the bag and then made a really stupid mistake. Instead of pushing me and running in the opposite direction, he grabbed the camera and ran in front of me. Well, he had pushed me. I saw him there, and I just tackled him. <laughs> and he was, this, he was like a 30-something you know, guy kind of you know, tattoos on his hand and leather jacket. And Peggy, my wife, was with me. She said, I've never heard such language come out of your mouth. I said, stop it, you You know, and I started yelling. I had him down. I grabbed the bag. And the Russians, the Russian people came around and tried to grab him and stuff, jumped right in to help me. And he got up and ran away. 
But had he grabbed the bag, uh, grabbed the camera, and ran the opposite direction, no way I could, no way I was going to run and catch him, you know. But he pushed, he pushed me forward, and I was like falling forward, and I just tackled the guy. And uh, I was surprised at how hard I fought for a damn D90 and a 70 to 300, you know. This guy could have taken out a razor blade and, and done me in, you know. And you know it would have been maybe in memoriam on Nikon. He died for his D90, you know. <laughs> I'm not sure, a D3S maybe, but a D90, you know, you're going to die for that. But um, I've been pretty lucky, but you got, it's constant vigilance, constant vigilance. But you haven't had any problems in terms of violence, right? Because I'm planning to go to some parts of South and Central America, and I'm a little worried that I'm going to have all this multi-thousand dollars here. Are you traveling alone? Yeah. Yeah. I would try to maybe, uh, depending on your budget, go to the tourist office and see if you can get a guide or get somebody with you. If you get, if there's two of you, and there's a watcher, and there's a local, but I have never, I've never been, you know, held up. I've been, I've been arrested. I've been, <laughs> I've been held under uh, suspicion of being a CIA agent. Uh, I've, I've had all that stuff, but I've never really uh, been like accosted on the street outside of that, uh, that one guy in Russia. Yes, sir. I have. Um, I have camera uh, uh, equipment insurance as part of my, um, um, my professional uh, package. The, the problem, you know, if you are not a professional photographer, um, your household insurance, you can have a rider for your equipment. But if your equipment is considered to be tools of the trade, you need to get separate uh, insurance on that. Uh, I live on a stream down in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and we got slammed by um, the, the Irene and then Lee was even worse. And I lost um, a lot of camera bags and, and stuff in my garage. And I just put in the first claim in 30 years. I've been paying equipment insurance for 30 years. And I put in a claim and damn, I got paid. So it was a, so, but it really speaking, if I had taken that $1,000 a year or whatever it was and put it into an escrow account and invested it, I could be driving that Mercedes now. But anyway, that's, that's a whole nother thing. Yes, sir? Um, this last video you shot, that, that was with the DSLR. DSLR, yeah. There's some Sony NEX uh, uh, 5 in there, too. And you used an auxiliary sound on the, on the shoot? Uh, for the interview, I, I did what's called dual recording. I recorded the interview into the, um, into the camera, but also into the recorder. And then um, when, when we sat down, we, we replaced the audio from the camera with the audio from the recorder. Yeah, when you're, when you're considering DSLR video, the weak point is audio. audio yeah. sure. The audio is not good. It's OK for ambient sound, but for interviews, it's really terrible. And um, there's a, the way around that is to record um, into your um, audio recorder at the same time that you're recording the, uh, into the camera. and then. Uh, some of the software, there's a software out there called a Pluralize or Dualize, will automatically replace the bad audio with the good audio, or you can use the new Final Cut Pro 10, and that'll do that automatically as well. Uh, Final Cut Pro 10 is X, or Final Cut Pro X, whatever you call it, is the cat's pajamas for those of us who are coming into video from, from stills and who uh, are not really mastering some of these other things. Uh, it's, it's the perfect um, nonlinear editor for still photographers getting into video, in my, in my opinion. I, I like it very much. It's kind of like iMovie on steroids, and, but it's very easy to understand. I always say, if I can understand software, anybody can, because I'm you know, really slow with that. Yes, sir, in the back. Two, two things. Uh, what I've done before to master audio on the field, in a sense, is as long as your recorder and your camera space and times are in sync, when you drop them both in the folder, they'll, they'll, they'll line up. Line That's up. a very good point. But a, the other thing I kind of did, because I used to do video before, um, the file name on the, on the camera, DCS. Yeah, right. Um, when I hit record, I say DCS001, and then just do shoot video. So then when you play back, you can see You've got it. Yeah. Like a, that's like a clapper. That's, that's a great idea. See? Before or after. Fantastic. But my point is, for this video right here, did, did the actors or did they get paid for anything? Did you pay them out? No. No. Bill, Bill Cowan, I took he and his wife out to dinner um, before I left the village. We took them out to a nice dinner. 
Uh, at a, he's a retiree, so he doesn't have a lot of money. So we took him out to the nicest restaurant in the village, which was pretty swanky, and we had a very nice meal. Um, tipping for pictures and stuff, it's a, it's a problem, you know. Um, the, you go to some places in the world and the precedent is set, you know, you take a picture, the hand comes out and stuff. We try to avoid it when I can. Um, and I try to, to, to do other things like when you, this is another reason why I'm more interested in staying one place and digging in because I, I've kind of had it with this going around tipping pictures to, to the same camel driver that's in every other stock shot of the Taj Mahal. You know, I, I, it was fun 15 years ago, but I'm over that now. I want to I wanna get a little deeper. But there are some places where, where tipping has become de rigueur. You can't avoid it. Um, but um, in that case, in the Cornish thing, no, uh, the, the other fisherman, the, 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 uh, the rough kind of guy in the, in, the, in, the, in the fish market area, that was actually Bill's son. And um, I bought him a beer or something like that. I, that's how I try to, I try to kind of befriend them more than just buy them off. Because I, plus, you know, they're English. They, they're probably worth more than I am by, you know, <laughs> three or four times. Uh, but um, uh, it's, a, it's tough sometimes when you get into some third world places, some developing uh, places where tourism has been there. The Taj Mahal, for, for instance, you know, there's sadhus, the, the holy men hang around there and they know that photographers love them, their stringy beards and their orange robes and stuff like that. You can't walk past somebody like that and not want to, so they, the hand comes out. It's, it's one of the, it's collateral damage from mass tourism, really, so. Yes, in the back, please. You said along the line of Prince you'll shoot first and then you'll look for a market, sell your work secondly. Mm -hmm. um, you gave us tips on how to shoot. Can you give us some tips on the second part? Well, you know, my tips are going to be tainted with the fact that I have a 30 year career working for all these other magazines and stuff. So, so I, I can approach them first and everything. I, you know, um, Making money from photography these days is p possibly the, uh, the hardest thing ever because there's so much good travel photography, nature photography out there, and people are, are you know, they can get it for 50 cents a shot on iStock photo and everything. So it's really, really hard to market standard wildlife and travel photography. What I would advise you to do is try to develop a specialty that, that uh, maybe a twist on that that you can do that nobody else can do. Wh whether you speak a language, you go to a country where you can dig in deeper than they can, or you have a special knowledge about animals or a special knowledge about some, something that will allow you to get pictures that nobody else has. That's where you can, then it's easy to market, you, you know, um, easier to market than it is to market, um, you know, a, yet another headshot of a lion in the Serengeti. Nobody cares. There's, some, there's too many of them out there, you know? And it's great that you got it, or, you know, and it's great, but, but it's not unique. Uh, so the, the best thing to do is, um, I would, you know what I would do if I was an advanced amateur, is I'd, I'd, or a photo enthusiast, I'd start slapping as much stuff as I could up on iStock Photo or whatever, one of those sell it yourself things. Um, to the point where you know uh, where where you get a return. If you're just paying to have it up there and you never sell it, then you then you know it's not going to work. But you got you do have to have a certain volume of pictures in a stock collection before it, it before it generates any money. So that's probably the easiest thing to do. And then um, the other thing to do is to put together like web galleries and then maybe send some emails to some editors saying you know I've got a really interesting story about food markets, African food markets uh, in Paris. Um, you know, and it's like, oh, African food market? Yeah, because there's a lot of North Africans there. So maybe, you know, it, it, it's not like, I went to Paris on vacation and here are my 12 best shots. Th they won't even open. But if you have an angle, something that's a little different or an expertise, that's the best way to try to market your stuff. OK, uh, let, me, let me take just a couple more questions and then, yeah. I was just wondering about uh, when you're traveling, Kind of um, bags that you use, like traveling on the plane. Do you have a wheel bag, and then when you get to a location, you're taking a backpack, you move around. Um, or, um, no, I do. I try to travel uh, in the same. I'm going to show you real quick uh, what I what I travel with. Uh, I I travel with um, a bag like that. Or, or right now, I've 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 uh, I've come. Um, 
actually, this is more what, what's in it. Uh, that's a Tamrac um, Velocity 10X. It's a sling bag. As I mentioned to you earlier, I have back problems. Well, uh, the, they pro it prohibits me from a shoulder bag because it pulls me over and I'm, I'm lame. But this, this bag, I can carry it in the middle of my back, but I can swing it around and open it up and, and pull things out. So for me, because I work in urban environments a lot, backpacks are not um, a viable choice for me because you have to take them off and put them on the ground to switch lenses. And if you're in Denali, a uh, national park, well, yeah, so uh, uh, a squirrel poops in your bag. That's, but uh, you, you, put, you put that bag down in, in Florence and you, and you turn around, it's gone. It's gone, you know? So for me, the sling bag is, um, is the ideal. And this, uh, because it rides in the middle of my back and I swing it around my ample girth and I open it up like that and I, I take it out as needed and then I zip it up and swing it back. Now, um, this is the Tamrock Velocity. There's a 9X and a 10X. I'm also now using one that's more about waist pack. It's a uh, low, low pro ah, something 300. Uh, um, and it's, uh, it, 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 it's more, it rides more in your waist and it, has, and it, it comes across. And um, so I carry that with my camera gear in it. And then, um, and then I carry a second roller board um, here um, for my computer and all the sort of tchotchkes. So basically I roll on two pieces. Um, now, Sometimes when you, when you fly out of this country and you connect onto a European or an Asian airline and they have that one piece, um, uh, what I'll do is I wear a vest or a big jacket and I take the computer and I put it in my pocket and if they make me check the second bag, I go on looking like Mr. Michelin and I give them the empty bag to check and uh, you know, uh, but uh, for most, most cases, if you have a small, you know, I'm, these two bags together are, um, are relatively, um, relatively compact. In fact, I go on looking much more compact. I'm going to try to find a shot that shows you what they look like together. I go on looking much more compact than the average college kid coming home with his dirty underwear and his, and his hypoallergenic pillow and all that other stuff that people are cramming on board. I mean, the airlines did it exactly wrong. Instead of charging us to check bags, mm -hmm. they should charge you to carry them on. Yeah. That way, if you have $6,000 worth of camera equipment, you'll pay $30 to carry it on. But they did, they did the exact opposite thing. So now, in my experience, uh, fully the, the last quarter of the people that get on board uh, have to check their bags. So, so um, I combat that by trying to fly the same airline all the time, getting into, uh, I'm a continental well, I've been platinum. I'm slowing down, so I think I'm only going to be gold next year. And I get on early, so I get my overhead space. But I do try to. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have time a lot to repack things and stuff like that. But that's what I do. Yes, sir. When you're editing, these days, if you're looking at YouTube videos, the clip length is three quarters of a second. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, even TV shows now, if you, yeah. music show Glee, it's yeah. bam, bam, bam. Yeah. I noticed your editing seems to be much more contemplative. Are you thinking about your end user, or are you editing strictly for yourself and then hoping someone else will pick that up? Um, I'm I'm trying to get more contemporary and more and more quick, but right now I'm still editing a slow 60-year-old guy pace. You know, <laughs> ah, one picture, another picture, and I try to do some you know cuts here and there and everything. But you're right that the tendency is this MTV you know kind of stuff and. Uh, you know, for a while there, I was really trying to appear young and hip, and I've just given up. <laughs> you know, I give up. I, I, there's nothing I can do to, 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 to appear uh, young and hip, but I am trying to uh, learn to, to do some quick cuts. Pacing, it's, you know, it's, if, if you do it to mix it up every once in a while, like you notice in that Cornwall video, there was a, a time lapse in there, a time lapse of the, of the tremendous tides that go in there. And that was, you know, and some techno music and stuff. My 26-year-old, my middle boy, he, he thought that was cool. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, so um, I try to pace it. But you're, you're absolutely right that things are, you know, that, that attention span is, is real short. Yes? When you did Paco and New Guinea, mm -hmm. uh, did you do the sound on that? Uh, yeah, but the editor that I hired, he, he, he was like slowing down, they're chanting and stuff. He, he did some pretty interesting sound design on that. Because at one point he almost dropped the sound out. Yeah. 
Yeah, he he, he kind of and there's there's one underlying like real deep bass note at one point. He he got carried away with the sound there. Yes, sir. About what laptop do you have? Uh, this one, um, uh, Mac Pro, uh, uh, 13-inch Mac Pro. I'm, I'm looking now, I just bought my wife a MacBook Air, and now that you can put um, big big uh, SSD things in there, like I think you can put a 480 in there now, I'm looking at a MacBook Air for my next one. Uh, smaller, 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 everything smaller. Yes, in, in your Papua New Guinea, you're, you seem like you were changing perspectives often uh, with a lot of high judgment. Are you moving your tripod for a, in, in each occasion, or are you hand-holding some of them? Uh, I was on a tripod or, or braced, and I was using my 70 to 300, because you don't, those guys would not redo anything that went during their makeup thing. They wouldn't move, they wouldn't do anything. So, and, and it was raining out, so we were under this little tarp. So I was just kind of hanging back and, and using the 70 to 300 to, to, to get little slices. And I also had to watch my backgrounds uh, were very busy sometimes, so I had to pick the, the places to, to shoot, you know, um, that look good. So, so that's where the 70 to 300, you know, zooming in and just coming in like that helps. Yes? Uh, I have a little rain jacket thing that goes over the camera, a, a little, it's like a sleeve that's made out of neoprene. Uh, I forget what it's, Storm Jacket or something like that, stormjacket.com or d Google Storm Jacket, it's in there. <laughs> oh, I dance. Yeah, I'll dance in the rain. I'll do. I'll sing in the rain. I do anything. All right. I think. Um, I think we're we're just about um, up against it. Are there any uh, any other questions? Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming out this morning. For more information, please visit us online. Give us a call or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.